Okay, so this was just shared with me. And I love things like this. This is a communist classic. Really, really exciting. This was just shared in a comment, and I thank you. This is awesome. Today we're going to look at something that probably nobody has really seen or heard of. I thank you for being here, and welcome. So here we're looking at something called the Chronicles of Georgia. At first I didn't think much of it, and then I started to notice the sheer size of it. Some call it the Stonehenge of Georgia, and it's built up on a hill, as we can see here. We're told it was built in a year, and never completed. In the Soviet era of Georgia, here we can see the Georgian landscape. And we're told this baby was built in 1985, in a year. And we see more structure around it. And I think if this was in America, this might not be allowed to stand. It would get leveled. And what would remain, we would be told, is an old fortification, maybe a civil war. And look at the people. Here's a little man, a little man, a little man here and there. And I love the communist narratives, because many of our wonders are attributed to a hundred years ago, even two. But in a communist nation, where they are simply writing as they go, as far as the history is concerned, similar to the palace in Bucharest, they tell us these things were thrown up in the 80s, when they look exactly like the things they tell us, again, were built over a hundred years ago, which I still don't believe. I think they're older. But here, 1987, one year, incomplete. <laughs> and what was the plan for this? This is a good time to say I don't know. I would love for anyone to show detailed construction photos of this. There should be hundreds if it was really built in 1987. You might think, no way, as you should. Could they really claim this was built in a year in 1987? Would anybody really believe that? And I would be willing to believe it, maybe, with a lot of photographic evidence. But thus far, I have not found any. And I don't think they give a damn. Again, Soviet-era ruins. They can say whatever, whatever they want. They say he was like an artist. And there is one column that looks like it's been facaded right at the entrance. Let me show you. So here is what will be used to sell this narrative, is this stupid pillar right here, all goofy, and clearly just a facade job. And in fact, I believe this one is probably an original. Of course, I'm not sure, but it looks like it's been painted or partially painted, and then they didn't have a ladder, so they just left it. Boss, should we get a ladder? No, forget about it. They've hired an artist that's coming out next week. Here the artist came out. But they only paid him to do one pillar. So, this one was done by the State Department. Whitewashed, similar to the White Cities, or the World's Fairs. I believe everything was just painted white, cleaned up, for a fair. But here this clearly looks new. It doesn't even look half as nice as this monument up here. It's not the same hand. This is something goofy. This was probably done in 1987, right here. But not this. This having the grandeur of anything from the old world. And I almost can't believe I'm telling you it's built in 1987. This is simply what I read down here. Let's have a look. The Chronicle of Georgia or History Memorial of Georgia, is a monument located near the Tbilisi Sea. I'm probably not saying that right. It was created by Zurab Tsuratelli, a painter and sculptor known for controversial monuments. This guy. So that's it. It was created by this guy. Let me stress. In 1980. 
five. That's it. Done. He's very confident, you see? Yes, he says. I created this in 1985, but I didn't want to finish it. I just want to wear my little red sweater and not answer any questions or show any photographs of how I completed this in one year. Oh, okay. The monument sits at the top of a large, large set of stairs. There are 16 pillars that are between 30 and 35 meters tall. That's 100 feet or so in America. And the top half features kings, queens, and heroes. Really reminding me of the San Francisco Palace, but even nicer, actually. Georgia was annexed by Russia in 1783. It was incorporated into the Soviet Union like a business. All of this national stuff is business. Into the Soviet Union in 1936 and renamed the Georgian Soviet Socialist Republic of Georgia. What a long-winded name. During the Soviet period, here we go, Zurab built this monument with Soviet funds. Really? The one-year wonder? During this period? So what period? It was incorporated into the Soviet Union in 1936, and during this period, Zurab, what is the period? During this period, Zurab builds the monument. And yet down here, with Soviet funds, during this period, he is said to have built the monument. Short little page. Look at this page. Up and down. Here we go. No construction photos. A very stubborn man taking credit for this. Built in one year. Arms crossed. Looking away. I don't know. I don't know what else to say. He was born in 1934, Zurab. So that's it. They're going to officially tell us that was built in one year in 1985. What can I say? No, I don't know what to say. Of course, once again, I don't know. But I've seen such things being given credit to much older time periods. And here they want to throw this off as an incomplete one year 1987 construction. Pretty baffling. And I'm shocked and I'm not shocked. I've seen this pattern, so I'm not shocked. But I'm shocked that they would be so bold. So, so bold. But they don't have the backstory or population to justify a World's Fair or something else. So they just have to pull this 1987 artist story on us. And here too, this would all be done in one year. One quick and hasty, incomplete year. With Soviet funds. I didn't think communism was really that into art. Maybe this kind of art is acceptable. Depicting kings and queens. And again, I think everything that communism is not for. But I could be wrong. I love this. That's all. And I think they could have done some things. Facade it over. This kind of looks facaded over here, for example, but not this. This looks original. This queen, the detail in the face, so lifelike. And here this looks crappy. And I've seen them do the same thing in Salt Lake City. And recently I will have shared the Bamberger monument in the middle of nowhere of Utah. And they did some of this facading over something older. And here I've just punched in construction photos and my cat just freaked out. I think she was saying there are none. Don't be a fool. But I find that I have a duty to at least punch it in. Oh, she is pissed. So I'll just leave it there. I don't think I could say anything else. There's so many ways to share something. So many ways to make a video. This is a photo of the Million Dollar Highway. Another screenshot I took from this PBS documentary. It's something we talked about in a past video. It was at the end. And in this photo, really not looking like the ruins of an old highway. And somebody recently asked me to watch a documentary. And I've watched about two minutes of it. And I got upset. I mean, just the narrative was stupid. 
We're told the Nabataeans, in like the year 300 or something, had a trade route through here, and they built a city. And then there was an earthquake, and they left. And it was forgotten until 1812. Until it was discovered by a Swiss explorer in 1812. And right away, I'm looking at these beautiful pictures, actually. I think I'll watch the documentary without sound. And I'm thinking to myself, what was built here? What did they build? What are they claiming as a city? Which part here, these huts, that we'd be told are carved into this hollowed out stone? Or these massive pillars? Or all these other little openings all over the place? And there is no explanation. Nobody built this city. Or maybe there is a partial truth in there. As we in this community propose, these could have been giant castles. Giant cities. Cities for giants. Or just certainly bigger than us. Constructed of what material? It's unclear. Some brick, perhaps concrete, glass. Tons of glass, I'm sure. A very beautiful, modern, over-the-top giant city here we can see more city and we just see these little pockets a little pocket little pocket little pocket and everything else melted to shit and forgotten again discovered not even any modern people occupying it really in 1812 just discovered by a swiss and i'm torn between sharing my salt lake exploration or this i think i'll share a little of my salt lake exploration and ultimately, tomorrow morning, I'll make a full video on it. Really great time. I took my new little camper to Salt Lake and explored some sites. And I look forward to sharing that with you. Here we can see the palace tomb. Here we go. Just cooked out anymore. And it starts to look like Utah. More like up here at the top. Almost unrecognizable. But here we see it all. Now in Utah, this would be very suspicious. You see the transition now. Up here, looking natural. Still could be kind of natural here. A little shelf. We see such things in all mountains. Levels like this. A few scattered blocks we might say are natural. And then we move down here. Now really getting advanced. Constructed, no doubt. And nobody came up here and carved this. No, this was built and has been cooked out. You see the dripping hair. You see it all. You see the beautiful transition to what would become our natural looking realm, sometimes turning blocky like we see here. We see things that baffle us in nature. We see sandstony column looking things and arches and what looks like windows. And here it is. And even here, palace, but not tomb. Stupid to be a tomb. So let's start at the beginning. A historic city in southern Jordan. Not far from the Dead Sea. It has been inhabited as early as 7000 BC. So for a people who just discovered it in 1812, this is pretty bold right here. Here we can see the incense trade route. This is how this was all made possible. Incense trading, box of incense, a couple bucks, even today. And then the Romans come into the story around the first century. But then it began to decline as sea trade routes emerged. So certain again. And an earthquake in 363, precisely, destroyed many structures. An earthquake. And the city continues to decline until the Swiss traveler in 1812, Johann Burkhardt, rediscovered it. I don't even know about Johann. I'll just leave Johann out of it for now. So, famous for its rock-cut architecture. It's a UNESCO World Heritage Site and one of the new Seven Wonders of the World. Whatever that is. A new one. Tourism was... <laughs> Hit hard, soon recovered after the sea. So anyway, that's it. That's what you get. And here, the narrow passage that leads to Petra. And you see how there's like partial lending again to the Utah-ness. But we don't see things like this left. Sometimes, 
uh, in New Mexico, Bandelier National Monument. We see openings and carvings like this. One of the best preserved areas. But tons, actually tons. Once you have the eye to see it, you realize it's everywhere. Here again, we could be told these are Native American ruins. The same thing that we see in the Southwest. They would just knock down this arch and these columns, put a leaning ladder somewhere, a little basket, and look back here, look at this. In, if this was in Mesa Verde National Park, they would either facade over this or dynamite it. The openings they could sell to the public. The openings they could tell us were carvings, but not this. This doesn't fit into the American narrative, but I have no doubt in the Grand Canyon we would have seen such things. And look at this amphitheater. Again, looking very natural, and yet not melted out. This isn't the byproduct of an earthquake. And in fact, there are some really good pockets of preservation, like we see here. Just a hodgepodge. But we're able to put the puzzle pieces together here. And I don't even think it was rediscovered in 1812. I bet you it was rediscovered in the early to mid 1900s. And from the top, just looking very natural. Just a melted, natural looking mess. And it's not until you get into this canyon that you start to see the preservation. And perhaps this face was protected by the plasmatic discharge that cooked our realm, which I believe one of the biggest candidates for creating this discharge is the sun. And how beautiful, look at this precision. These Corinthian columns, just the higher up it is, the better the preservation. And this is just exactly like what I was looking at last night in Salt Lake City. I mean, exactly. I was pointing my camera up as high as I could and capturing the soffit. I believe that's what they call this under part, and the detail within it. Unlike slot canyons such as Antelope Canyon in Utah, which are shaped by water, the seek is a fault. Okay, thank you. And it was split apart by tectonic forces. Very important that they throw this in here, this section. Here a niche entrance. Okay, so a niche entrance that we can't even get through? So just somebody carved the steps here, started to carve some kind of arch, but it's all cooked out. This was not intended to be an entrance. But yet these are always near entrances. I can recall something at the Mormon temple like this. But anyway, here it is. So really unbelievable here. And I don't want to say I know. This is a good time to say I don't know anything. These are just my thoughts at this moment in time. And the only way this could happen is just being perfect at one point, like the rest of Petra, the beauty that we see, and becoming completely cooked out. That's the only thing that makes sense to me. But we would be told this is all the result of carving. And real quick, let us just peruse through this video that was shared with me. Let us look at the handiwork of carvers. Now that we've checked out the backstory, and it really excites me because once we understand what we're looking at, I think we'll begin to discover a lot more. I don't think everything has been discovered everywhere, by no means. And I think it's fair and important to listen to what they say. Maybe they really do care and are just perfectly clueless. Really. Spice traders coming up here and carving all of this. Does that make any sense? And giant spice traders. I mean, if we're to believe the spice story, how large were these spicemen and women? Even he knows it. What is he thinking? You don't know about the spice story. It seems like an awful lot of spice to sell in the year 300. And he's right. That's a lot of spice. Just this would be an amazing feat. And we have miles and miles of this. We always see this. Even the wiki doled up more than this. Here we can see a statue or something. And back here a relief like a mantle. A beautiful mantle that some fireplace would have sat under. And here you can see a faint, faint outline of ornamentation that has just melted down. And this is just biblical proportion here. 
Look at this, so now like I told you, up at the top, if you were just flying a plane over, you would just say, oh, Blob City down there, Melted Blob City, but then we see the structures beginning to emerge. There's one, two, three levels right there. A lot of these window openings have just melted closed, but we can still see them, you see? And in fact, my theory is that we should be able to go with a hammer and pop these out. I mean, when you see an arch, I don't care where you are, and it's sealed off like this, but then you see other little openings maybe for some reason, you can probably be certain that you can just pop out the window. Again, like we see back here. These will all be openings. I mean, everything. But some areas have been sealed off with a thicker layer of melt. And I think once you begin excavating, you can actually get to the original structure. And that's why we have access to a lot of this. And more excavations could be done to reveal more below it, I have no doubt. And this reminds me of what I was showing you in Moab, that archway at the top. I mean, it was completely a Petra-esque pocket of preservation. Here we can see what looks like a pipe, some kind of a tube that's been cooked out. Really interesting. And you can actually see the block lines here, just flowing. They just melted, but you can see block lines. I have no doubt it probably wasn't a small brick. These would have been large blocks, as we see here. Larger size blocks. And this was preserved for some reason. Perhaps because it was attached to water and stayed cooler. Just this little part. Everything else really got cooked out. But we do see an opening right here. And otherwise you wouldn't know. It would just look like another layer. So thank you for sharing this with me. And I do look forward to watching the whole thing. But it would have annoyed me to sit back and listen to it for an hour. At least, I've spoken my piece now, and I can watch the rest. But again, I think I've said what I wanted to say. I don't want to beat a dead horse. I would like to share these discoveries I made in Salt Lake, but I'll reserve that for next week. So, for today, thank you for being here. I love you all. God bless, and I'll see you soon.